maybe in one way focusing in on a specific application, but on the other hand, we're going to be blowing that up to have the broadest implications possible. Uh, so joining me now to talk about the internet computer and blockchain singularity um, and the ways that these can help make the internet and compute more, more equitable, perhaps. Please give it up for the founder and chief scientist at Definity, Dominic Williams. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. A terrific conversation. Obviously, you heard that. We were listening to it backstage there. And I think there's going to be uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the pillars, maybe, that Winston was talking about that we're going to be touching on in our conversation. The first thing I'd like to do, though, is to take a step back, because we're talking about Web3, a, a, a new generation of, of compute and computing, in a way. But I'd like to know how we got there. So could you start us off, perhaps, by telling us about our journey to Web3 through Web1, maybe Web2, and I know you've been involved at all of these stages one way or another, to the point where we're at and we're looking at this next generation. Um, sure. Um, so, you know, Web3 is a very exciting new phase um, of the internet, um, but it's enabled by new technology. Mm -hmm. And um, at the Definity Foundation, uh, we work on this thing called the Internet Computer. And uh, it will power a lot of these kind of transformative changes that are coming with Web3. And the Internet Computer is um, conceived as an extension of the public Internet that enables the Internet not just to connect everybody, but also to provide a compute platform. So back in the 1990s, there was a big debate about whether people would want to connect via America Online, CompuServe. Yep. Microsoft had this idea um, about the information superhighway and you know, the, the marketing was that everybody would be put in a kind of walled garden yeah. by corporations where it'd be very safe and the content would be curated for them. But in the end, everybody wanted to connect um, by the public internet, which was free and permissionless, and created a fantastic free market where you could create a website without permission and a competitor couldn't apply to the owner of the internet to have your website slowed down, for example. So, um, you know, today, people build using traditional technology um, on platforms like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and so on. And these are um, uh, private platforms um, run by big tech corporations generally. And you build using traditional technology components like databases, web servers, middleware, and so on and so forth. And uh, the Internet Computer provides a completely different way of building absolutely anything where you can just write a new kind of code and upload it to the Internet where it runs um, on a public network. And uh, in the same way that the Internet provided um, capabilities that you couldn't get from America Online and CompuServe and so on, yeah. the Internet Computer provides people um, building on the internet computer with a completely new set of capabilities. So the way that I look at that, Web 1, very, very simplified, and you may disagree, but Web 1 was very much that someone's going to publish something and you read it, and you can click through and find other resources that are connected to it. Web 2 is where all of a sudden we can start as consumers to make our own content. Well, this sounds great but there's still big tech at the middle of it. I'm creating content, whether it's through micro-blogging platforms or through video uploading platforms or whatever, but I'm not seeing a great deal of benefit from that. It's still some big tech behemoths in the middle of it. There's still a lot of this centralization, and that's Web 2. But Web 3, that's an opportunity where actually there isn't the big tech hubs right in the middle of it. It's me as a, a stakeholder in the internet, in the web. Actually, I have a degree of control, a degree of say. I'm not at the behest. I'm not beholden by a handful of big tech platforms. Does that 
kind of also fit into the journey and the narrative here when we start talking about a distributed computer? Well, you know, the internet computer can be thought of as a world computer, um, as a kind of everything computer. And when you build on this everything computer, you, you can, you're building with a new kind of code. And that code is tamper-proof, so you don't need a firewall to protect it, for example. It can't be encrypted by ransomware. It's unstoppable. And it can also, if you wish, be made autonomous. Now, if you're an enterprise, um, there are already some banks, for example, tentatively building, um, and, and some uh, government initiatives tentatively building on the internet computer now. And you know, for these enterprises, um, the proposition is slightly different. They don't want to be captive customers of big tech, and they want to build systems that can't be hacked, and that are more robust or unstoppable. But for people in Web3 who are really trying to reinvent the services that we use every day, mm -hmm. um, they're looking at um, you know, reinventing ownership. And of course, everyone hears about things like NFTs, but these are really just um, simple manifestations of the grander Web3 trend. So, you know, you know, a fully realized um, uh, s an example of a Web3 service would be something like a social network that runs on the internet computer that, that doesn't have a human controller or doesn't have a company behind it and is run by a very sophisticated DAO, a thing called a decentralized autonomous organization yep. um, that's called a service nervous system that can completely controls the service. It acts both as a digital democracy um, with many stakeholders, but also as a system that allows that social network running on the internet computer to be updated um, in a fully automated way, such that you know there's, there's no human beings, not developers, not companies, no board of directors, no CEO, and that the service runs, we might call it an open internet service, um, runs you know, approximately analogously in some sense to uh, you know, an open source software project. Um, but of course, you know, r running a, a, a social network or any other service in that kind of manner is, is, is much more complicated. And the users of these services um, will become part of the um, community in a, in a new way. Um, they'll become owners of the service in the sense they hold governance tokens. Um, they'll, they'll become part of the team because they'll help with tasks like content moderation. Yep. And um, you know, essentially, these services are going to make their users founders. And very quickly, they're going to amass enormous uh, decentralized teams all around the world of millions, from millions of users. And that's how Web3 is going to break the network effects of Web2. And it's just beginning to happen now. And it's going to be very exciting. OK, so there's a lot there to unpack. and you. You went on to DAOs uh, already, and we will come back to that <laughs> again in a moment, and some, maybe some of the lessons learned from earlier applications of this. Um, but you talk about reinventing apps and services, but running on this platform. Is this what you mean by this term, the blockchain singularity? Is this ability for this world computer, the internet computer, to, to run a, a reimagined, if not reimagined, a re-architected version of apps and services that we already use every yeah. day, but without this centralization? Yeah, so the blockchain space is very confusing. Um, and it's confusing partly because there are these huge financial incentives involved that people promoting this blockchain or that blockchain want, want to sell you their tokens. Um, and so there isn't really the free flow of information. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of misconceptions. So oftentimes, you'll hear that some kind of Web3 service is built on blockchain XYZ. Um, but if you dig a bit further, you'll find that the service is really running on Amazon Web Services. And it's just keeping a few tokens or NFTs on the blockchain. And then if you dig further still, you'll find that the blockchain runs on the cloud. You know, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, yeah. Hetzner, and so on. So, um, and, and, and of course, those kind of blockchains, they, the smart contract code 
can't serve web. You know, it, it's it isolated. It can't serve much data. It can't do much data processing. It needs the help of the cloud. The internet computer is a very different thing. Uh, the internet computer is created by a sovereign network of these things called node machines, a bit like the internet is created from routing devices, yep. um, which are um, run by and owned by independent parties. And uh, the smart contracts that are run are very, very efficient. I mean, it's designed to ultimately enable people to build um, systems that run more efficiently than the systems on you know, legacy traditional tech like Amazon Web Services. Um, so a very different thing, you know, a, an increase in efficiency of tens of thousands of times. The code can serve web. It can reach out of the blockchain environment um, to the point that it's better to think of it not as a blockchain, but as a, a world computer, as an everything computer, as the internet computer. And um, that really uh, makes it possible to do completely new things. And when I talk, when the project talks about blockchain singularity, what it means is that people are going to start building entirely on the internet, on the internet computer. And they won't need traditional tech, like cloud services or databases. And everything, you know, and everything from enterprise systems through financial systems to, um, you know, metaverse, social media, games, you name it, will be built on the internet itself rather than on traditional legacy tech. OK, so a um, couple of things there. What have you got against the cloud? Because you've mentioned it a couple of times there. Uh, you've called out Amazon Web Services and the fact that some other networks are, you know, may claim to be one thing, but actually are just running on the cloud somewhere. We spent the last 15 years, certainly in enterprise <laughs> IT, talking about moving from on-premise systems, from data centers, moving into the cloud. And now you're saying, or are you, that actually this cloud probably isn't where the next generation of technology might best be placed. Well, that's right. So um, look, I mean, first of all, um, <clears throat> moving uh, enterprise systems out of your you know, homegrown data center onto the cloud is a very out good. Out of the basement, basically. Yeah, 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 it's a very good idea. Um, and you know, the cloud has brought a hu enormous advantages <clears throat> to entrepreneurs, for example, who, um, by reducing startup costs, like back in the dot com era, it was extremely expensive to create something like a social media service and scale it with demand. You know, and I myself, you know, many years ago spent time <coughs> excuse me, in inside data centers um, in installing new blade, you know, blade servers, yep. trying to yeah, scale up capacity. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's obviously much more convenient to um, just build something on the cloud and, 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 and make use of capacity that's already provisioned for you. Instant capacity. Click, but it's provisioned. All it's, of a it's sudden, brilliant. Stephen Wright yeah. Fry retweets my service, yeah. and it will scale instantly. Yes, yeah, so I'm a great supporter of the cloud. It's, it's brought about um, you know, uh, enormous efficiencies, and it's made it much easier for startup entrepreneurs um, to, to scale out systems, and that's something that's dear to my heart. Yeah. But um, you know, we're not talking about changing that with the internet computer. The internet computer can be thought of as a kind of crypto cloud, if you like, um, in the sense that uh, you can use it in the same way. It's like a serverless cloud. You can just write this code, upload it to the internet. It runs there. So you get many of the same advantages. Um, but the difference is, firstly, that you're not building on um, a proprietary infrastructure. You're not going to become a captive customer. You know, it's, it's like the difference between using AOL and the internet. Um, you're building on a free public network. <clears throat> and not only that, but when you build on the internet computer, you're building on something that's created from a protocol um, that uh, leverages advanced mathematics to create different properties. So for example, your code is tamper-proof. So um, you know, all of this started long ago now, um, back in 2008 with Bitcoin. And you, know, um, you don't need a, a firewall to protect a, a Bitcoin, right? If you own Bitcoin, you, you can control it with a key. There's no firewall protecting your Bitcoin. When you um, interact or you, you, know, you build something with smart contracts on Ethereum, again, that smart, those smart contracts uh, which store data and process data, don't need a firewall to protect them. And in exactly the same way, 
Um, when you build something uh, much more complicated, uh, like a large-scale enterprise system or a social network on the internet computer, or indeed something much more simple, um, you don't need a firewall to protect it from hackers. It can't be encrypted with ransomware. The code's unstoppable. There are lots of other great things, too. Um, the code is greatly simplified compared with the traditional IT that you'd run on the cloud. Yeah. And in addition to all of those advantages, um, you can, if you're in, in, the, in the business of Web3, you can build a completely new kind of open internet service that um, runs under the complete control of a community um, and doesn't, you know, isn't, isn't exposed to the individual decisions of uh, any one person or company or, you know, there's no need for a board of directors and a CEO. And this actually provides the groundwork for some very exciting new business models for entrepreneurs. And I do want to come on to those in a moment. I, I really, really do. I want to hear about how we op you operate at Definity as well. Um, but I just want to come back and maybe address some of the questions that probably in the mind of our audience, certainly in, in my mind. Um, one of the criticisms about existing blockchain-based networks at the moment, for example, is speed, or more particularly, lack of speed. Uh, and that certainly seems to be a hindrance when competing against traditional financial transaction-based networks. So what is it that makes the internet computer network not only fast enough, but really, f well, fast enough to be able to handle the volume of compute that you see a worldwide computer would need to be able to handle? Well, there are, there are three main challenges in designing a network uh, like the internet computer. Uh, number one, as you mentioned, is speed. Yep. Number two is, is throughput. What's the total volume of transactions you can process? And what's the total amount of data that you can store? And number three is cost. What's the efficiency? Yes. Um, blockchains generally have made great strides. I mean, the modern proof of stake blockchains have made great, great strides um, with speed. Um, where they tend to fall down is, is throughput and, and efficiency, and also with uh, key capabilities like serving web. Um, the internet computer is the only blockchain in existence where smart contract code can serve web. And there are various other technical challenges too. So um, with respect to the internet computer specifically um, and speed, uh, there are a number of innovations. So when you um, run a transaction that can update data, say for example you're using a social network and you make a post, mm -hmm. um, it will commit that post that you made uh, in a second around about a second, which is pretty quick. I mean, most people, if they press, imagine you're on Reddit and you press post, one and done. That's yep. fine. Now, of course, um, you have to be much faster than that when you're serving content into a web browser because users want to see stuff appear straight away. So the way the blockchain handles that is it pre-finalizes transactions. Um, it's called a query call. So for example, uh, if the, when the, if somebody is writing, creating a system on the internet computer and they want to serve you know, the HTML, JavaScript, CSS, um, snippets of data into the page uh, in response to JavaScript requests and so on and so forth, um, that content is ty typically what's known as pre-finalized, which means that um, it's, it's kind of signed by the blockchain ahead of time so that, I, so that the internet computer can serve it in mi milliseconds. With respect to um, throughput, um, behind the scenes, the internet computer is composed of subnets. Uh, subnets um, are, 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 are formed from node machines, from independent node providers that are combined by the governance system of the internet computer um, using something called chain key cryptography. And, and that also makes it possible to weave all of those subnets together into a single blockchain in uh, the internet computer. Um, which is thus horizontally scalable. So whenever it needs more capacity, it can just add more subnets. Um, these subnets, if they're overloaded, can split into two subnets and things like that. It's a okay. pretty sophisticated system. Um, and with respect to efficiency, I mean, it, 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 it's tens of thousands of times more efficient than what you'd con consider a traditional blockchain. Okay. Um, and it's, a, it's in the same ballpark as traditional IT, and over time it'll be, I, I believe, significantly more, more efficient. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the, I'm, I'm pleased you beat me to the efficiency point. Um, <coughs> and then my other question before we start moving on to the disruption in terms of um, governance, and we'll come on to DAOs as part of that, 
is the nodes. Who, who owns these nodes at the moment? So internet computers already out there. Who is it then who is currently the custodian of these nodes? Is it, is it people like you and me? Is it, are they corporations somewhere? Who is it? So uh, you or I could, could run a node, um, uh, 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 they're called node machines. Uh, they resemble something like a blade server, um, but they have a standard specification and there's no redundancy within the machine to reduce cost because the network you, you know, has redundancy. So there's, you, know, you only have one power supply in these yeah. things and so on. Um, and there's no RAID for the storage, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, you can either build one of these machines to the spec or you can buy them from people who'll build them for you. Um, and then you, um, in, you, you have to install them in a data center. In principle, you could do it from home. But the internet computer um, creates subnets by combining node machines that have different owners, uh, that are in different data centers, in they're in diverse geographies, yeah. and um, have a you know, variety of jurisdictions. Like you wouldn't want all the nodes in a subnet in the EU, for example. So um, the way that the internet computer forms these subnets limits um, how many node machines an individual node provider could run. And so if, you're, if you want to be a node provider and maximize the number of nodes, you want to install them in different data centers around the world and so on. So you've got a lot of diversity there in terms of the ownership, in terms of the geography, yeah. in terms of the roles of those node machines. But what's running all of this? Ah. Uh, what, what is, it, is there still a central brain, if you like, that yeah. is um, divvying out everything here? Yeah, so this is where, I mean, it can get a bit mind-bending for people who aren't used, used to it in the same way I, I think I remember the internet was, you know, back in the 90s. Um, the internet computer isn't run by an organization. It, it's run by a thing called the network nervous system, which you can think of again as a kind of DAO, but it's something more sophisticated. Um, essentially, it's a kind of digital democracy. The reason it's called a nervous system is people stake these governance tokens called ICP to create neurons. Um, these vote on proposals, but you can make them vote automatically by configuring them to follow other neurons. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very effective system. I mean, the Internet Computer Network um, will soon have been running for two years. I mean, it's been under development for really since 2015. Yep. But uh, since it's been running, uh, I think it's only had a few seconds downtime. And the network has self-updated uh, hundreds of times at this stage. So. Um, People are constantly proposing technical improvements, and uh, these are submitted oftentimes in the form of code. And when the brain of the network, the network nervous system, adopts them, it actually uh, applies these to the node machines. So the node machines follow the instruction of the brain, if you like, and um, they upgrade the software, the network software that they run, and, and therefore upgrade the you know, mathematical protocols, network protocols, that they use to interact with each other and create the internet computer. Um, so for example, these node machines are, are listening to the brain and uh, it will instruct them, for example, to combine to create a new subnet to add more capacity to the internet computer, this everything computer because more people are building on it and it needs more uh, capacity for compute and, and storing data. Um, so you know, that's one of the great innovations. If you look at the internet itself, um, the internet is, you know, uh, mostly decentralized, which is a very good thing, but but actually, uh, you know, ICANN, which is a uh, an American not-for-profit organization, um, still plays some pretty fundamental roles, and and there are some issues and problems that derive from that. Um, you know, if you look at domain names, for example, ultimately, um, you know, uh, if you have a domain name, in principle, uh, the registrar of the top-level domain can delete that domain name and. The ICANN can even change the registrar that's responsible for a top-level yeah. domain name. Um, so, you know, that's something that's not desirable. The internet computer doesn't have a, an, an organization running it. Instead, it has this thing called the network nervous system, uh, which is open and permissionless. Anybody can submit proposals to it. Anyone can participate in, in, in the governance of the internet computer. And so, in that sense, it's an advance from the internet, you know, the way the internet itself works, which, of course, is not surprising because it's you know, coming along 30 years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we've got five minutes left and I've got three questions that I want to try and fit into that time. The first one of those is, uh, very quickly, just tell me what, where it is and what kind of applications are already running on internet computers. Secondly, is about 
Dfinity, your role at Dfinity and where Dfinity fits into the internet computer. And then finally, how people here, if we pique their interest, can best engage with internet computer. Maybe uh, look at how to experiment building an application for that. Can we do that in five minutes? Sure, sure. Okay. I mean, so first of all, I won't come. I mean, it, it, enterprise adoption is just coming now, so we've got some sort of uh, governments, banks, all kinds of um, partners tentatively building things on the internet computer. They're just wanting to build because they don't want to be a captive customer of the clouds, and they want to be able to build without fi firewalls, and they want to be able to build secure systems that are much more robust. Um, and that have some other properties. But if you're an entrepreneur, for example, and you're interested in Web3, um, you know, uh, take some time, uh, look at the sample apps, see how easy it is to build on the internet okay. computer, and then look into this thing, another acronym, acronym I'm or an acronym I'm afraid in, another thing called the SNS, which stands for Service Nervous System, okay. um, which is a new technology uh, that's derived from the network nervous system, the NNS, just rolling out now. And this is an integral part of building the next generation of Web3 services. So you create something. Um, for example, I think the, f the moment the, f the first service using this technology is called OpenChat. Yes. Yeah, and it's, it's a chat service, a, mes a messaging service that runs on the internet computer. It's, it's a little bit different to something like WhatsApp, right? I was going to say, is it a WhatsApp for Web3? Well, you get the same functionality, albeit it tends to have more group chats on it with, uh -huh. with thousands of people in them because, um, you know, there's a web, people in the Web3 community use these um, group chats quite heavily. And uh, what's interesting is, although it's got the same functionality, albeit it's more optimized for these group chats, a bit like Telegram, is that your account on this messaging service is like a crypto wallet. And uh, you, you're going to be able to send like tokens, uh, Bitcoin, uh, NFTs with chat messages, which, is in, which I think illustrates the ways that something like this, because it runs 100% on the blockchain, illustrates the ways um, Web3 services like this can, can provide new functionality. Now, the, the next big thing is a pr pr proposal has just gone into the network nervous system uh, a few days ago um, from the developers. They say that they want the network nervous system to take over, if you like, this, this chat service, create an, a service nervous system governance DAO, and assign control of open chat to this governance DAO. At that point, uh, only the governance DAO will be able to push updates to open chat. And there'll be something called a decentralization sale to distribute governance tokens in this governance system uh, to whoever's interested. Um, the proceeds of that is not an ICO. Um, the proceeds of that swap event um, will be continue to be maintained in the treasury of the governance system itself. So you've got this, there'll be this incredible service that has no owner. Um, it's owned, if you like, by its well, governance system, which has its own, yeah. So, yeah, by the centralized autonomous organization. Um, of course, the founders will get governance tokens in, in too. And this thing's going to grow by distributing uh, governance tokens to users who help uh, with referring other users, uh, help with talks like content moderation. You know, it's going to be making, I think, in the next few years, millions of users into founders. And uh, this is a fundamental innovation, um, in, in obviously, in, in the way that, you know, uh, things like social networks uh, can run. Um, that will prove very revolutionary because ultimately, you know, um, we're kind of replacing the role of you know, governmental organizational structures like companies and partnerships and trusts and funds with these entirely digital um, governance systems. And uh, for, for entrepreneurs, it's a new way to um, grow, to take on the might and the established network effects of yeah. web, web two um, ser services and to get rid of the bureaucracy involved with traditional um, company building. Uh, new ways of raising money from anywhere in the world, new ways of growing, um, and to create something that has a competitive chance. Like, there's no other way of producing a chat service that can take on the likes of Snapchat and WhatsApp, right? Um, you need to go Web3. And, um, you know, right, right now, this stuff's um, gearing up into motion, and there's all these interesting things being created. And it, as, as, if anyone's an entre entrepreneur wanting to build things on the internet, um, this is the direction they should head. 
Um, and you know, you go um, fast forward five years from now, 10 years from now, certainly the vast majority of startups um, won't be, have startup companies necessarily behind them. Um, they'll be DAOs, mm. they'll be community DAOs. And that's what I find so fascinating about this conversation is that obviously there's a technology disruption here, but then there's a whole corporate governance yep. uh, disruption conversation as well, and it really fuses the two of those together. Dominic, thank you so much thank for, you, for sharing that thank with you. us today. Uh, please show your appreciation for Dominic from Definity. Lots more conversations to be had on that, and I have a feeling that uh, before four years from now is out, we'll be talking about this uh, again. But for now, right. one more time, please give it up for Dominic Williams. Thank you very much.